All right. Oh, you guys are definitely going to recognize our next performer. Uh, who planned this one? Ellery Yeagley. As a writer and illustrator whose, lo who lo whose love of prints is both purple and true, she hopes that writing and illustrating will be enough to gain her entrance to erotic city. Because she certainly lacks Sheila E's rhythm and has four fewer breasts than Vanity Six. She is 10 inches taller than Prince and is also concerned about fitting through the doorways in erotic city. Without any further ado, Ellery Yeagley, I want to be your lover. Okay, so this story is 87% true. <laughs> the chill in the air is brutal. My toes and fingertips, once blissfully numb, were resurrected by the 40-minute train ride back to Bergen Street. Now they hum and pop painfully as I trudge through the gray snow toward my apartment. This little bend behind the grocery store is the only dangerous leg of my commute. Broken glass from an abandoned Chevrolet Caprice litters the darkened sidewalk. I'm on high alert, but not from any fear of what might lurk in the shadows. In fact, I fear nothing these days. You see, the prize that waits around this unlikely corner makes my long work days and the miserable weather a joy to suffer through. I approach it slowly and with reverence, despite the bitter wind pushing at my back. It is the largest single turd I have ever encountered. <laughs> and it is my magical link to Prince Rogers Nelson. <laughs> the sacred loaf entered my life about two weeks ago when I almost walked through it on my way to the office. The year had just closed on a particularly lonely and unsuccessful period in my life. I felt down in the dumps and reacted bitterly to everyone and everything I encountered. My first impulse was to feel affronted by this poop's existence in my alleyway. <laughs> How dare it! I glared down at the pungent obstruction. Who has the time and the chutzpah required to release a perfectly formed dump like that out in the open? <laughs> It was so huge that part of me was unwilling to believe that there were human bowels anywhere in my neighborhood capable of producing such a fecal bounty. It was polar bear-sized, stegosaurus-sized even. As I stood and marveled, a breathy falsetto drifted in from a distant car stereo. I ain't like those other guys you hang around, it told me. <laughs> they always seem to let you down. Suddenly, I knew that the juxtaposition of that otherworldly voice and this unearthly ball of dung wasn't mere coincidence. The certainty was life-altering. That night, I slept like a baby and was blessed with the most amazing dream of my life. In it, I stood calf-deep in a vast ocean of blooming violets. Morris Day materialized at my side and handed me a glass of cheap champagne. 
Together, we crawled through a looking glass held aloft by his bodyguard and valet, Jerome. <laughs> On the other side, the three of us traveled to Prince World, a massive theme park where girls were not allowed, only women named Wendy and Lisa. <laughs> and Susanna, and Sheila, Vanity, Apollonia, Kim, Carmen, Nona, Sheena, and Ellery. <laughs> the park's special attraction was a giant purple totem pole. <laughs> Prince himself stood at the pinnacle, performing thaumaturgic feats based on his own lyrics. I watched with wonder as he bat-danced at doves until they sobbed for mercy. <laughs> I stood at Gog as he became my brother, my mother, and my sister, too. <laughs> my jaw dropped as he threw the ass from sexy MF into the air and turned it into sunshine. <laughs> Needless to say, I felt exhilarated when I woke the next morning. I was a solid Prince fan long before the supernatural deuce found me. <laughs> my devotion to the man now bordered on the rabid. My, my relationship with my roommates and coworkers be began to deteriorate as a result of this newfound fervor. Guess what, friends? I announced to my roommates over breakfast that weekend. I've discovered that Prince is a wizard. <laughs> and I don't mean like a wizard with a guitar solo or a wizard with shoulder pads. I mean he casts spells. I've seen it. Life became similarly awkward during work hours where I maintained spiritual focus by incorporating my new belief system into mundane office tasks. <laughs> my coworkers watched with horror as I crunched through a starfish from the local aquarium store every morning with my coffee. <laughs> I substituted a capital letter U for the word U in professional emails. I insisted on using numbers instead of words wherever possible in office memos. On my days off, I looked for reasonable excuses to leave the house and visit the magic shit without arousing my roommate's suspicions. <laughs> in my heightened state of awareness, I saw its form reacting to the elements, felt the mysteries of love and sex and nature reflected in its shape and fullness. The first week was dry and I watched it shrivel up like a gnarled piece of driftwood pushed beyond the tide line. When the snow returned, hydration plumped the poop to a fertile browned mound <laughs> the size of a Nerf football. But ultimately, all of this meditation and ritual was just a means of counting the hours until bedtime. I'd take a couple of Tylenol PM in an attempt to chase my dreams and hasten the moment when I'd once again sit at the base of Prince's purple totem pole to watch him create, mi excuse me, create miracles. <laughs> It's now been seven hours and 15 days since I first encountered the sacred loaf in my alleyway. I've not had another dream since that first transformational night, but I haven't given up hope. Besides, tonight is different. As I approach the Pooh alcove, I see a single, jagged scar marring its surface, and I stop dead in my tracks. Light pours out from the breach in its shell as I stare in utter disbelief. Shimmering purple motes catch in my breath and eyelashes. I look around for other witnesses to this miracle and see a young couple crossing the street at the other end of the alley. I shout after them in my excitement, guys, come look. I think it's hatching or something. <laughs> they shuffle past as quickly as the frozen sidewalk will allow. When I turn back around, the mystic turd is gone. Prince stands in its place before me, but not as any one man. He is every prince, rapidly cycling through all incarnations of his past eminence and all projections of his future glory. <laughs> the metallic matador pants are there. The Kiss era crop top, the yellow chaps, the turban, the fabulous love sexy blowout, his female alter ego, Camille, the third eye gazing serenely from, be from beneath his velveteen afro, the purple totem pole. He smiles at me and every last bit of chill leaves my bones. I could die happy at this moment. I didn't put this here, he says, gesturing towards where the poop used to be. You did. <laughs> 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 
I am somewhat taken aback. I beg your pardon, Prince? This has been a bad year for you, he continues. You needed to work through some shit, so here it is. He shrugs. I hope it helped. I stand and stare dumbly. This is not at all what I was expecting, and now I don't know what to do. Prince just laughs and pats me on the shoulder. His touch reminds me of the dream moment when, his ass, when that ass reacted with the air to become glorious sunshine. <laughs> it's okay, he says. I produced a lot of shit, too, when I needed to get out of my Warner Brothers contract. <laughs> so long, kid. Just as he begins to, dis to disappear, I find my voice. Prince, wait. May I please hear Wally? He shakes his head solemnly. No way. All right, well, could you teach me the 23 one-night stand positions? <laughs> Honey, no, he says. That's some ninth-level shit, and you're not there yet. <laughs> all right, all right, I say, crestfallen. And with that, he's gone, physically, at least. I hear him call after me one last time as I turn toward home. Get Off is a good song, though. <laughs> you like that flute solo, don't you? I sure do, Prince, I say. Thank you. I never meant to cause you any sorrow. Never meant to cause you any pain. 